we are almost getting to the end. I want to call uh, for a panel discussion three very interesting pe uh, people. We're going to talk about funding under fire. This is very important. Um, the resilience of uh, Israeli tech. I want to call to the stage John Medved, founder and CEO of Our Crown. And I want to call to the stage Amy Gutman, journalist at Forbes, and Eyal Niu, managing partner at Pitanga. Guys, the stage is yours. by giving a quick introduction about myself. My name is Amy Gutman. I'm an American journalist based in London. My background is hard news, current affairs, and latterly startups and entrepreneurship. Uh, I've worked for a lot of major networks around the world, including ABC Australia, CBS News, PBS News, BBC, Associated Press, Forbes, many others. So now let me introduce uh, our guests here. We have John Medved, who is uh, founder and CEO of Our Crowd. And I'm also pleased to introduce Ayal Neve, who is managing partner of Pitango First. And they represent two of the biggest and most active VCs in Israel. So welcome, gentlemen. Let's get right in. We all know how the resilience of this country and startups uh, included in that have been impacted by the events of October 7th. But I want to hone in on specifically how the investment world has been impacted, both in terms of your own activity as well as uh, the investors that you deal with outside of Israel. And if you could each take a turn. So the war has not been a positive event at all in any part of our lives and certainly in the business environment. But before you get to the specifics of the war's impact, you have to realize that the war came at a particularly bad time in the business cycle, especially for venture capital. Because what we've experienced over the last couple of years is a global downturn in the investment in venture capital-backed companies. So if you take the peak of uh, 2021, and you look at last year's numbers, 2023, you see a 70% reduction in the amount of money invested. And this is not just Israel, this is global. So Israel went from 26 billion in 2021 to 6.9 billion in 2023, which in any business is a tough thing. When you start with that and then add the war on top of it, you've got trouble. And you can look at all kinds of aspects, such as people in reserves and uh, negative uh, attitudes outside of Israel. But the good news is there seems to be a little bit of a Dickensian, as in Charles Dickens' environment, where it's a tale of two tech cities. On the one hand, there are the strong Israeli companies. And the strong Israeli companies are not just plowing through the fog of battle and the troubles in the global environment. Many of them are prospering. You see companies like Wiz do the largest single fundraising in Israeli history in the middle of the war. A billion dollars raised up at a 10 million kind of valuation. You see people acquiring companies for billions of dollars. You see our companies being acquired. And in fact, what's so interesting is the recent data about 2024 shows that there's over already four billion invested in the first five months. And we're probably on track for doing a $10 billion a year, which will represent almost a 50% increase which you're not seeing a similar increase going on globally. So it's a really confusing environment, not easy to make simple, clear-cut pronouncements, but just face it, Israel is resilient, the sky is not falling, our tech economy is continuing to 
jump ahead. The guys who are suffering, however, are the early stage companies who are really just starting and looking for their Series A. And that's why they're experts on this panel, like Al Lee, to talk about that. So thank you for that. It's a good, uh, it's a good segue. I would say in terms of early stage investments, first of all, I mean, the war itself was uh, put all of us in a very difficult situation as human beings. And no, nobody can go on and do what they do, especially when you have to think long term, you have to uh, think positive to make these early stage investments. So certainly the first few months, were, uh, we, were, we were told to stop. I mean, we, we were really uh, confused about everything and, and what will be the length of the war. But I must say, that, I mean, I'm, I'm very much connecting to what John had just said. Uh, everything is bouncing back. I mean, we are here at Cyber Week. But certainly, I think if you look at the, they say the last 14 exits in cyber, 13 of them happened here in Israel, which is, if you think about it, it's amazing. During a war, people are buying companies for the long term here in Israel, which is amazing. Uh, I think that around 50% of, of every cent that goes into cyber, is attracted to Israel, which is also amazing. I mean, I mean we're such a tiny country. So in essence, um, you know, it, it's been a harsh impact. I think in the long term, if things don't change quickly, we're going to feel the, um, the impact over the next year or two. I mean, we're very lucky that we have so many fans uh, looking at Israel and being positive about Israel. Uh, it gives us some uh, delay in the impact that we feel. And, uh, but we can only sustain for so long. We have new funds and, and everything, but things have to go back to normal. I want to get to the new funds in just a little bit, but first of all, it, it obviously isn't business as usual, even though the numbers you both cite are truly compelling. So how have each of you changed your own behavior since the events of October 7th? Are you investing about the same? Are you investing less in fewer companies? We have a unique model in our crowd where we're not just investing from a single fund that we raise or two funds every three or four years. Uh, we raise every day. Okay, we have to go and find great companies. We negotiate term sheets, which we either lead or we follow others. And then we go out to our community of today. It's a quarter million investors worldwide from 195 countries. And we're managing two and a half billion of their assets. So we have to go out and explain to them, we've got this great investment idea. Join us. We're putting our own money in. Here are the terms. It makes sense. And we would like to raise as much as we could in this environment. At the moment, we're holding our ground, meaning that we're about flat year to year from last year. Last year was a little bit down from you know, 2022, again, with the market. But my slogan with my team is, hey, in this environment, flat is the new up. Okay, if we're able to hold our ground despite a global downturn, despite the war, that's just good enough for us. And obviously, you've got to cut costs, both in-house as well as with companies. You have to make sure that you're not spending money that you don't have, okay, and you have to look for the cyclical change because, you know, it, it happened, I've been through now a number of cycles, and you've got to realize that it never goes straight up to the right, okay? And it's not everything together. There are cycles. And so you have to be aware of them, that even, for example, in a down cycle, there are these huge meteors like NVIDIA that, you know, go up like insanity. Okay, not insanity. It's totally justified. But uh, the, the bottom line is that uh, it, it's, it's a complicated environment where there are very, very good news in the general market, difficult news in other parts, and we, we are just doing as, as well as we can, and I think we're holding our own. Hey, Anna? So I, I think, you know, I, I started, I touched it in my previous answer that uh, we have gone back to making investments at the same pace. Um, I must say that uh, we don't raise money every, uh, uh, for every investment, but we do have to raise new funds. And I must say that I'm so uh, thankful and surprised at the solidarity and support 
that we have seen from LPs from all around the world, uh, which is amazing. It's, it's nothing that we could really uh, um, foresee, and uh, and that's that's been very very strong, uh, uh, had a very strong impact because you know when we have the money to invest, uh, we know uh, who to look for, and I, and I mean this institute has been a great one for us to. Uh, uh, find new opportunities, especially in cyber. So I would say in terms of areas of interest, cyber is certainly an area that we believe for the long term uh, will continue to grow. Uh, the threats around the world are just uh, uh, growing. Uh, public uh, uh, opinion engineering has been a, uh, a weapon in the hands of governments and I think that everybody has to protect themselves uh, in one way or another. Uh, generative AI continues to be a huge area of interest. We've been investing in generative AI since uh, 2016 with companies like Graphcore and AI21 and uh, Iguazio and others, and we have a, a lot more. EID, for example, which is doing very well. Okay, so it's like the sales pitch for the end. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I'm, I'm just saying that uh, generative AI is just, we're just beginning. Mm -hmm. And the combination, by the way, is also amazing. Generative AI for cyber and cyber for generative AI. So many combinations, so much to do. And uh, I think uh, we're very, very excited about what's going to come in the, in the tech world with quantum, with AI, with cyber, so many opportunities. So we're back to, to our normal investment pace with the uh, 2 fund, which is amazing. I know each of you have um, set about launching new funds. Um, each of your companies in a very thoughtful way uh, since October 7th, in a more philanthropic way. Tell us about those. Um, when the war broke out, we immediately realized there was going to be a problem, especially with the early stage companies, that they needed someone to come in and to say, we're going to lead rounds, especially in the seed in the uh, Series A. So we built a resilience fund which managed in literally a matter of months to announce a fund, raise a fund, and deploy it in 46 companies, 23 that were already our own portfolio and 23 outside. It wasn't a great amount of money. It was about $15 million. We put it all to work. We raised the money without taking any management fee or any carrying interest, so we did it essentially pro bono. And what I'm very proud of is that this leveraged about 10 times the total amount of money, meaning that if we put a half a million dollars into a company, we were the leaders or part of a $5 million round, which I think was important. And there are other groups who are doing that. Now, I, that deserves some applause. Uh, there are other groups who are doing it, like Iron Nation and Safe Dome and others, and they all deserve applause and it's important, uh, but it's not sufficient, okay? And we have not scratched the surface, in my opinion, in terms of mobilizing the resources among both the Jewish people and the broader Friends of Israel and our partners, who many of them want to stand up and support Israel, but there haven't been those frameworks outside of charitable stuff, which is really important, but right now, people want to invest in Israel. And if you're just an average person sitting in Los Angeles or in London, or if you're in Hong Kong, and you say, hey, how do I invest in Israel? Because I think it's going to be a great opportunity, whether it's in cyber or AI or quantum or whatnot. It's not so easy. that You go to our crowd, but there should be dozens of opportunities like our crowd. And there should be ways that we as an ecosystem can not just get literally millions of investors interested in the country, but also bring billionaires to Israel. People like Bill Ackman, who stood up and bought 5% of the Tel Aviv stock exchange, made a great trade, great investment. We need more of that so that we can continue to grow. Yeah. In, in terms of resiliency and uh, resilience, uh, we also <laughs> did something called Iron Nation which has supported many, many startups and basically bypasses the whole infrastructure and connects people from all around the world directly to startups in Israel. And that has been amazing. And I think there are more than 15 companies that got 
about uh, seed funding or follow-on funding, uh, which is really great. And kudos to everybody that are part of this. We are just one part of this fund. Uh, on the other hand, we also uh, did uh, something that's more on the philanthropic side, uh, a fund called the ICF, uh, which is the Israeli Children Fund for Kids. And we know so many of these kids, there are more than 400 kids that actually lost their parents in this terrible uh, terror attack. And uh, we are going to use the power of high tech, the power of cyber and the business uh, community here in Israel in order to make sure they get the, the best support uh, and the best uh, springboard for life as if their parents were here. So I welcome everybody. We have a wonderful website. We are raising a lot of money for these kids and we need a lot more. Certainly raising most of the money from outside of Israel, but I will say that I feel the high-tech industry in Israel can take full responsibility for these kids and we don't need to let them feel like they've lost their parents. So thank you everybody. Very encouraging from you both, thank you. Um, I want to flip it, we have a few more minutes. Uh, I don't want to dwell on the negative, but it's impossible to ignore, especially with all, all the news that we see coming from around the world, minute by minute. John, you referenced it a bit earlier. Um, what about all the negative sentiment that we hear about and those of us in the diaspora can feel? Um, what kind of impact has that had on the institutional investing world? So far, not much but it's something that we have to be completely aware of, monitor, and encounter, because it's a huge strategic danger to the country. If Israel's brand becomes that of a genocidal, predatory, apartheid nation, that's not a good brand for business, especially the high-tech business, which is by nature, future thinking is supposed to be progressive and inclusive, and this is, there's just no way you can spin this properly. So, so far, the big companies, all the multinationals who've been here, the Microsofts and the Facebooks and the Googles and the Amazons and the NVIDIAs, okay, have stood incredibly strong with Israel. And any attempts inside or outside those corporations to somehow weaken their uh, position or commitment here has been met with a, a very, very impressive response from the management of these companies. And I think they deserve applause for that. I mean, that's an unbelievable move on the part of these uh, companies. On the other hand, we, in the high-tech world, can't sit on the sidelines and watch university researchers abandon Israeli research. There is a huge problem going on now with academics publishing and being kicked out of consortia. And we have to take steps to make it where people want Israelis, because there's going to be more funding, there's going to be great research and science. You know, we're not really very good at long-term planning and strategic thinking as a, as a society. You know, the joke is an Israeli long-term plan is like next week until Thursday. Uh, but the, the reality is that we better get thinking about this because there is danger here. And uh, it's long term and it's systemic and we have to figure out how to regain the advantage of the narrative and how to continue to build our brand as a country, as an industry, which helps and supports our business. Hey all. Brief, brief yeah, comments because I want to give you I would say, you know, we are living in a very global ecosystem. We are part of the global ecosystem, is the high-tech industry. We don't even sell into Israeli companies. We have to make sure that our brand is back where it was. We cannot sustain this for a long time. And it's, it's not for us to take any blame for what has happened in any way, I believe. I serve in the army and I've, uh, I've done my bit in special ops and everything. But at the same time, we have to look around and make sure uh, that this war is over and that we are back to where we were the day before. Okay, in our last uh, 40 seconds, let's do a quick lightning round question for each of you. This is your moment. If you can each tell me the top two companies in your portfolios that you think are really gonna 
blow through the roof? Well, when you ask me to choose among the 450 companies that we've invested in directly, it's like choosing among a very large family. But number one, we have a company called Halo, which is making semiconductor accelerator chips for the edge, which is going to be a huge business. The company has, has raised over $300 million so far. It's valued over a billion, and I think you'll hear a lot about it. The second one I love is a company called Blue Green Water Technology, who are essentially cleaning up the plague of toxic algal bloom, the green scum you see on waterways around the world. Turns out that makes the water bad, but it also emits methane, and it's responsible for 10% of global greenhouse gases. So if you can clean up water and clean up the, the atmosphere, it's a great company. So look for Halo and look for Blue Green Water. Yeah. So I would say, you know, we are, you know, we have two companies that are gearing up for a, a, a big outcome. That's uh, everybody know. I think most people would know them. It's Apps Flyer, uh, which is doing amazingly, and Via Transportation. Both companies are doing fantastically well, and uh, hopefully everybody will be part of this. So um, I don't have to tell you about them, but I think uh, it takes time. It takes a long time to build these IPO-able companies, and I think uh, we've now reached it. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you both, and thank you for your very positive initiatives. Pleasure.